Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest deep dive webinar from the Cluster Centre with Dr. Nicola Watts, who is joining us this morning from Australia. I am Claude Barry from the Cluster Centre, and by way of introduction, the Cluster Centre is an Irish SME who supports cluster development and building the cluster ecosystem in Ireland. We do this in three ways. One, we support cluster development and capacity building by working with individual clusters and policymakers. Two, we surface common conversations and cluster challenges that we are facing collectively. And three, we create a cluster to cluster dialogue where clusters, networks, trade associations, research gateways can learn and knowledge share from each other. Owen Kennedy from the Cluster Centre is also here today. And first, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Nicola Watts. Nicola is a strategic management and innovation ecosystems consultant and a former cluster founder and leader. Nicola has worked across more than 20 countries in a range of sectors, including <clears throat> agri-food, education, ICT, and natural resource management. Nicola is highly skilled in clustering and smart specialization, place-based development, collective impact, systems thinking, governance, capacity building, and strategic collaborative leadership. Nicola is an adjunct professor with Federation University Business School and a co-chair of the TCI Network, Oceanic Chapter. And for reference, the TCI Network is the leading global network of people and organizations working in clusters and innovation ecosystems around the world. Our topic for today today is the role and interrelationships and principles of clusters. Over the course of 30 minutes, Nicola will explore, explore the role and diversity of innovation actors in the innovation ecosystem to better understand the interrelationships of clusters and to present on the seven principles which underpin good clustering practice. I will now hand you over to Owen to explain the running order for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Loda. So the ground rules for today, Nicola will present for approximately 20 to 25 minutes with 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Everybody is muted, but we really do encourage you to use your web cameras and to submit questions or comments via the chat function. If you wish to make a comment or ask a question during the Q&A, please unmute yourselves, call out Nicola's name, followed by your own name, your organization, and your comment or question. This will st help stop us talking over each other. Indeed, Nicola's preference is that today we have an interactive conversation rather than just pure Q&A. If you encounter problems of broadband, please bear with us as we may need to pause the camera. The session has been recorded. And without further delay, I'll pass you over to our speaker, Dr. Nicola Watts. Thank you and uh, good evening from southeastern Australia on a very cold wintry day here and good morning in Ireland and uh, wherever else uh, participants are joining from around uh, the world today. It's great to be with you and thank you so much Cloda and Owen for the opportunity. I have to say up front that I enjoy facilitating active sessions rather than doing so much talking um but uh, here goes uh, and i hope we'll have some opportunities to to interact at the end of the session i've got a few slides to um, support what i will cover today and uh, as i said i'll talk to that for about 20 minutes or so but please put any questions and or thoughts and reflections that you might have in the chat as we go along and we can pick those up at the end of my presentation um, as Claude mentioned, I am co-chair of TCI Oceania, TCI being the global network of cluster practitioners around the globe, but I just want to make it very clear that my insights today relate to Australia um, and not other Pacific Island um, nations uh, in Oceania. What I'm presenting today here comes from my own experience as a cluster founder and leader. Uh, combined with observations and conversations with many others across um, clusters and innovation systems, innovation ecosystems. So hopefully the, all the technology is going to work well for us. Right. Nicola, if it's not allowing you to move, if you hover over your screen on the bottom right, it should, or bottom left, it might give you a forward and 
backwards button. Can you see it there? It's or if working. you press the space bar. It was working perfectly before. That's always the way. Perhaps if you <laughs> un unshare and reshare, you might just restart it. Well, we'll try that again. Technology is a great way of introducing these <laughs> foibles just when it's um, showtime. <laughs> All right, let's see how we go. Right, that's looking better. <laughs> okay, um, as uh, discussed, in this short time, the objective of the session is to really explore the role of innovation actors across the innovation ecosystem to better understand the interrelationships with clusters and also consider what I consider to be seven um, core principles that actually underpin clusters. But perhaps it's uh, useful to first consider or, or revisit the question of what is a cluster and therefore what makes a cluster different from other organisations. I'm sure if I asked you for definitions of a cluster, there'd be many different ones and please do share them in the chat. But what I've included here is one of Michael Porter's early definitions, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, and where the focus and the benefits have clearly been on business and regional competitiveness. I'm sure that many of you will have also met E4 Phelps Williams, one of the world's best known and respected cluster specialists and facilitators. E4's definition highlights that it is actually an umbrella term and will mean uh, many different things to different people and depending where you and your cluster are at on your cluster development journey. It highlights though that clusters are industry led, but inclusive of other key actors, that is governments, knowledge institutions and communities, or what is often re referred to now as the triple or quadruple helix. In my former roles as a cluster leader, my simple definition has always been we're an industry-led collaborative network which works together to tackle opportunities and challenges too big for one single business or organisation to tackle on its own. And in the cluster I founded, that was to support the broader purpose of sustaining a vibrant and resilient food sector, which was so important to our regional economies and communities. But I think there's actually, um, it's important to note that clusters are usually quite a natural phenomenon, and that is that they emerge from a shared burning platform. And I think that in Australia, um, uh, uh, clusters don't actually appear well in policy. And I think uh, that's because governments have had a go previously at driving cluster initiatives, and they've failed miserably. miserably. So we need to acknowledge that uh, they do naturally emerge when businesses are working together to try to solve um, common problems or tackle um, collective opportunities. But I think there's also more to clusters now as well. I think as we see clusters and the principles of clustering mature, clusters are increasingly not only focused on just being good for businesses and regional economies, but there's a much stronger focus on creating shared value that is supporting good business outcomes, but economic outcomes, but also social and environmental outcomes. And clearly it's important for each cluster to actually firmly define its own purpose, value proposition, and what it stands for. So why are clusters important? Well, through their connections and networks, they certainly unleash innovation, as many of you will appreciate appreciate. Importantly, they provide the glue in innovation ecosystems. And I use the term innovation ecosystem here to mean the, the large and diverse nature of actors and the, the resources, all the resources and infrastructure necessary for innovation. I'd just like to explore this a bit through the Global Innovation Index. 
The Global Innovation Index, as I'm sure you're familiar with, provides an insight into innovation performance across nations, across a range of important um, innovation elements. Obviously, I've been interested in the performance in Australia and what our unique strengths and gaps are. And I don't really have time to go into this in detail, but I hope you can see in the table included in this slide, some of the areas where we as a nation actually perform quite well, although not as well as Ireland, clearly. But it becomes quite apparent from this data that for us, it is the soft infrastructure. It's the social capital. It's the relationships and the softer skills associated with, with trust and sharing that might be letting our Australian innovation ecosystem down. It's not well connected. But you can see, as an example, Irish performance start to, is very different um, to ours. So it's really important to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your, of your own innovation ecosystem. As I said previously, clusters can and do deliver shared value, shared value for businesses, employees, regional economies, and in terms of social and environmental outcomes. And certainly clusters can and are playing a pivotal role in creating more positive futures. We're seeing clusters focus on sustainable development goals and things like uh, circular economies, and certainly dealing with um, the shocks uh, that, we're, that we're seeing and what a year 2020 has been for, 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 for where I am in Australia, we've had a, um, we've had a series of, of triple shocks. We've had drought, followed by the horrendous fires that we had over summer, and now we've got COVID. But you know, clusters are really rising to the challenge to actually um, support positive ways forward. But clusters are operating in an incredibly busy and crowded space, uh, particularly across the areas of business support and innovation. And in this slide, um, I certainly haven't included all of the not-for-profits and multiple other organisations playing in the connected spaces of social innovation and sustainability. But we can see, you know, how many people, how, sorry, how many organisations, whether they're, whether they're government, um, whether it's across entrepreneurs, financial institutions, investors, uh, it's, it's a really, really busy space. And so the key question is really about how well the ecosystem is functioning. And as per my earlier points, um, I would say that uh, we've got some gaps in ours. And for Australia, the sweet spot really appears to be to support more connectivity across all of the actors. At the moment, it would seem that we've got lots of duplication, we've got lots of reinvention of the wheel, we've got unplugged gaps, um, and we've got lots of wasted energy and lost opportunities that could otherwise maximise um, impact. So really needing to join the, the dots a lot better. So I guess, you know, my question to you, how is it in Ireland? How is it um, in your countries? But amidst this busy space, what then makes a cluster a cluster? Why are they different? And I'm often asked in Australia, um, is a cluster the same as a peak body? Because as per my previous slide, we have hundreds of peak bodies. We have um, a plethora of research and development corporations. So, so what makes a cluster actually different? So to answer that question, I've proposed that there's a dynamic mix of seven principles, or seven Cs as I refer to them, that will usually underpin a successful cluster. And this applies to formally incorporated cluster organisations, as well as less formally structured cluster networks. So the first principle um, is, is that of co-location. Um, cluster businesses and other stakeholders will usually exist in close proximity. This has been based on the premise, it's easier to cross corridors and streets than it is to cross borders and oceans, and that there are shared interests, relationships, histories and cultures 
and so on that draw businesses and groups together at local geographic levels. It acknowledges the benefits of concentrations of human capital and social capital also, um, and that clusters tend to naturally evolve around this principle. Co-location is also embedded with an objective, um, obviously to support regional place-based development and competitiveness. And here we see also the linkages with the smart specialization work. But in today's world, of course, we can be close, but also physically apart. And COVID is no doubt accelerating that. Uh, certainly global clusters are emerging around the burning platform of finding a, a COVID vaccine. Um, and the growth and emergence of virtual clusters is something I'm sure that we're going to see more of um, in the future. The second principle, and, and absolutely critical, is that of collaboration, where businesses or cluster businesses and other stakeholders are actually willing to work together to solve shared problems or tackle opportunities. This will often acknowledge that at times there will be competitive tensions that need to be respected and quite carefully navigated. Collaboration is such an easy word to roll off the tongue, not so easy to achieve in practice. Um, particularly here, I have to say, in Australia. So how does collaboration feature um, in, in, in the country that you're representing? The third is around co-innovation, where cl cluster businesses and stakeholders innovate together to solve problems in unique ways that create that shared value. Uh, this is all about, and it must be about, participation and uh, diversity and inclusion, which is absolutely key to allowing different ways of doing things um, to bubble up to the surface. The fourth one is around connectivity, where cluster businesses and other stakeholders share really deep connections such as supply chain relationships and shared interests such as market access or technology and workforce solutions, um, which also foster knowledge transfer um, across all those that are participating. These connections will often uh, extend well beyond local geographies to national and transnational levels. The fifth one is capability, where cluster businesses and stakeholders leverage existing shared capabilities and specialisations to take them to new levels, as well as build new capabilities and plug capability gaps. I would also suggest that capability here is also about uh, collective leadership capability, not individual, heroic, individualistic leadership styles that we've tended to value in the past. And I'll, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. The sixth one is around communications, where cluster businesses and others um, just regularly communicate and where this is underpinned by strong and trusting relationships, sharing information, sharing knowledge. But communications for clusters, very importantly, is also about the stories of innovation and collaboration that come from clusters, um, changing the narratives around what is possible. Uh, FEAL, that is Food Innovation Australia Limited, one of, our, um, one of Australia's uh, industry growth centres that is very supportive of clusters, recently launched a great publication which showcases some of the innovation that is supported by Australian food clusters. So uh, nudging the context to support deeper and transformational change through story is just so important. Um, I think it was David Corton in his book of the same name said, uh, change the story, change the future. So telling cluster stories is is just so, so important because it's the stories uh, that communicate the value of what clusters do and are doing. And I have to say often in um, resource constrained environments, it's often not a priority focus, but I would say make sure you've really got a chief 
um, storyteller. And I'm not talking about here, I'm not talking here about a slick marketer. I'm talking about someone who can help tell the authentic stories of innovation and collaboration and transformation, the successes and the failures, and demonstrate the little wins as well as the big wins that your clusters are having. And finally, the seventh C is a, around a commitment to act. The thing with clusters is that there is meaningful activity occurring on the ground. It's not just talk. So it's essential that businesses and uh, other stakeholders involved in clusters are committed to action and making things happen. I always say, beware of too many commentators who have no skin in the game to actually make things happen. Or make sure you get the balance right between process and content. Um, pilots and small scale initiatives to test and explore ideas and possibilities are far more important and engaging than protracted planning and talking processes. So whilst many of these principles will be present within a range of organisations and initiatives and you know, across some of the organisations in that previous slide I put up, it's really the interesting and dynamic mix of the trust and the social capital within these principles which underpins clusters. Clusters and cluster managers are seen as the glue and joining the white dots, or in the words of a, another cluster colleague of mine, filling the white spaces between all the other actors in the innovation ecosystems. It's really this uh, interesting and dynamic mix of the trust and social capital combined with their agility to adapt and pivot that really does underpin successful clusters. So given all these uh, other actors, I would strongly advocate clusters mapping and understanding the broader ecosystem in which they operate. It's really important to understand your context. Um, and just going back to that earlier quote of um, Michael Porter's, where clusters are responding to business commonalities and ex externalities, these can be at any level. So innovation ecosystems can operate at multiple levels, at the city level, at the regional level, at the national level, the global level, and within multiple sectors, whether it be food, med tech, energy, and so on. So it's, it's important to explore and also um, define the potential boundaries of this ecosystem. Know the who's who, the politics of that, the capabilities within the ecosystem, the movers and the shakers, along with the strengths and weaknesses. Make connections, identify what the, those actors are doing, join the dots, plug the gaps, build the relationships. Um, in this slide, I've borrowed a simple tool here from um, Strategy Tools, um, who also do some great work in terms of cluster development. It's a great tool to help that, uh, that, that uh, mapping process. Okay, we're going for time. Okay, final slide. Um, I hope just uh, within this short presentation, I've given you something to think about in terms of what differentiates clusters from other organisations and other actors within uh, innovation ecosystems and the, um, and the role of clusters within those ecosystems. Essentially through supporting and building cluster ecosystems, we're supporting innovation ecosystems while at the same time delivering shared value for all the actors involved. In Australia, particularly through our TCI Oceania chapter, at the moment, we're working to support more connectivity across our clusters and support cluster capability uh, development. Clustering in Australia at the moment, unfortunately, is not well supported and under-resourced. Um, so we're really trying to uh, look at uh, ways to um, strengthen our own cluster ecosystem. Uh, for me, cluster leadership is about uh, collective leadership, it's the same. As I mentioned earlier, there's 
there's no room um, for the heroic uh, hierarchical individual leadership styles in clusters. And um, borrowing the words of uh, Otto Sharma, there's a real need to work um, to ensure a focus on the ecosystem rather than the ego system. So that shift from echo, oh, sorry, from ego to echo is so important. And as we move also towards industry 4.0, we need to consider the requirements of um, leadership 4.0. We can't apply the same business and organisational management principles in today's world that were relevant for a bygone industrial era. This, absolutely the same applies for the way clusters are structured and their ways of working. Um, so a shared and unified uh, sense of purpose is absolutely key across cluster members. In relation to governance, uh, governance arrangements need to be fit for purpose um, because we need to remember that um, we're not only supporting governance for a, potentially a single organisation, we're actually supporting um, governance principles and arrangements across an entire ecosystem. We also need to think more broadly about uh, monitoring and evaluation. Whilst monitoring and evaluation of cluster activities is obviously key, we're also working with other actors across the ecosystem. So how do we measure system-wide impact? And recognising the importance of social capital, that is all those trusting relationships and connections, and um, it's important that we're just not measuring the tangible outcomes of, of cluster activity, but looking at how do we measure the levels of engagement within our cluster? How do we measure the sharing of information, the extent, the extent of our connections, the, um, the, the extent of the levels of trust, etc. And as a final point, I'd just say, we, we tend to create clusters um, as what I would refer to as backbone organisations. So clusters become formally structured as backbone um, organisations to support delivering shared value and collective impact across a range of businesses and stakeholder organisation. But it's essential that a focus is retained on the clear purpose and the dynamic set of principles such as those I've been outlining. Cluster organisations need to build collective leadership, not be the collective leadership. It's a subtle difference, I know, but it's an important one. I think we really need to be alert to organisations and clusters where um, managers and boards tend to, um, they, they come to be the leaders. Um, and organisations, or sorry, cluster organisations become hierarchical and lose their quintessential social capital. Um, th these are very um, Im Im important principles for me. So clusters, they're not easy to pin down. Each one is uh, unique, responding to their own context. Cluster thinking and development obviously remains a really ongoing and dynamic learning journey. Um, and I might leave it there. Thanks for allowing uh, me to share some of my journey. I hope it provides you with some food for thought and can support yours and I'm happy to open it up to some general uh, discussion.